My name is Sean Crublum, and thank you for joining us to the show where we solve business problems. And today, the problem we're solving is all about business partnerships. Now, thank you for joining us, and thank you for our guest joining us, Dr. Greg Chapman. Greg, welcome to the show. Morning, Sean. Now, Dr. Greg Chapman has had many roles in his 30 years of business career from working his way to vice president in a multinational company and working on three continents before starting his own company, Empowering Business Solutions, now which is in its 10th year. His experience ranges from operations through to marketing and strategic development. His current role he's in is an advisor to small businesses owners who are sick and tired of being small. Don't we all have that problem? He's the author of the internationally recognized small business bestseller, The Five Pillars to Guaranteed Business Success, which is a must read for all small business owners. He's also a publisher of the Australian Small Business Blog. Now, his latest book, and which what we're really going to be talking about today, is Married to the Business Honey, Love You, But Our Business Sucks. What a great title to a book. And it's obviously available in all good bookstores. Now, he's advised hundreds of small business owners, and Greg says if there's one thing he's learnt um, from his clients, it is, while well, money can't buy your love, happiness is a positive cash flow. Now, what I'm looking forward to talking to Dr. Chapman about is that it's about what couples and non-couples partners in business can teach others like myself. So, Dr. Chapman, what can couples and non-couple partners teach us in business? Well, you know, when I first mentioned to my uh, book distributor that I was writing a book on uh, couples and business, he said, why on earth would you want to go in business with your business partner, with your personal partner? And he said he went into business with his personal partner, his wife, and he sacked her from the business, they're still married, and maybe that's not a coincidence. But many people uh, do go in business with their uh, personal partner, and despite the odds, that many succeed. But often, couples in business get lumped together with family businesses. About 70% of the businesses in Australia are family businesses, but they vary from the very, very large multi-generational family businesses to father and son, mother and daughter, brother and sister, and so on, and just about any sort of family relationship you can think of. But I see they're still quite different from husband and wife or personal relationships, uh, uh, couples in business. And... Uh, one thing that pointed this out specifically to me was a, a conversation I was having with one guy who actually went into business with his brother. They had inherited the business from their father and the business was doing quite well for quite a few years. The older brother was managing the business and the younger brother was uh, working more out in the field in service delivery, just learning more about the business. And, and things went quite well until they both had both married and had families. And there was a, a certain rivalry between the families, particularly the spouses. And on one side, uh, one of the spouse felt that uh, her husband wasn't getting due recognition and he should get more value and share of the business. And it actually started to split the, the brothers apart. And in fact, the, the brothers actually split apart and uh, they didn't, couldn't work together anymore. They were forced to make a choice between their families and the business. And of course, the families took precedence. Now, when couples who are in business together, you don't get that conflict, of course, because they're the same family. And so that's where I see it's quite a big difference between families and business, and specifically couples and business. And of course, couples are the first generation of a family business which could go for many generations if it survives. Now, but I also have a look at um, uh, the different ways that family, uh, couples and business work together. There are different, I've seen that there are 
diff key differences between different types of couples and business. In my book, I talk about three types of business relationships I see between couples. The first relationship I see are professional peers. So, for example, they might have worked in the corporate world together and uh, as a professional couple, uh, uh, professionals, and uh, left the corporate world and start up their own consultancy business, for example. Another example might be they met each other at university, and a typical example of this, because I, uh, I actually uh, work a lot with, with this group, is architects. A lot of architect businesses are husband and wife uh, businesses. They meet at university, uh, and uh, and they start up their own practice together. So they're professional peers, but they also see there are non-professional peers as well. So they might enter a business which doesn't require a high level of uh, specialist skill, and an example of that might be they go into a franchise, they buy a franchise together, or they might um, uh, uh, run a cafe together. It doesn't require a high level of technical skill, specialist skill, but they're both peers, <coughs> even though they may not have some professional qualification. And what the key here is, in each of those examples I've just talked about, there's a good understanding of what each other does. But there's another relationship I see, and that's the non-specialist specialist relationship. Now, the example most common here is a tradie and his wife. Now, that's a stereotype. And, uh, and I've seen others where the specialist has been reversed. I've worked with a couple. The, the wife was actually a high-profile uh, florist here in Melbourne, and her husband was the business manager. But in this specialist, non-specialist relationship, what you see is someone with a technical skill, uh, a professional skill usually, and uh, the other person is trying to manage the business around them. They're the ones who have to pay the bill. They keep the books. They um, uh, chase the clients for their um, uh, for their invoices, and uh, pick up the pieces behind the specialist and, and make sure the uh, customer relationship is maintained. But the trouble is that they don't have the specialist knowledge that their specialist partner has, which causes a great deal of frustration for them, and they feel that they they're always having to come back to their specialist partner and that causes friction because they can't answer the questions that the, the client wants. And and that's the, that's the relationship I actually wrote about in the book because it's the most fraught relationship. And especially since if they weren't in a personal relationship, the non-specialist is probably would probably be an employee rather than an owner of the business. But uh, in a, when the business is operating together, uh, when the couple is operating a business together, of course they're going to have an equal share of the business. Now, uh, having defined what, where I see some primary differences between couple and non-couple business owners, let me move on to this, the advantages and disadvantages in this relationship compared to non-couple businesses. Now the first situation I see is the alignment between the personal goals and the business goals that we see with couples compared with non-couple relationships. We already talked about the brothers in business, how the family can pull them apart. But let's have a look at the advantage that a couple has here. They have the opportunity to align their personal goals with their business goals. So let's take an example of that. Perhaps they'd like to have a lifestyle business. Set up a, an example that might be to set up a bed and breakfast. So they uh, buy a bed and breakfast in some nice resort area and they manage the business together. Alternatively, it might be a tree change couple and you know, with the power of the internet you can run a business pretty much anywhere. So they might be in some rural location, uh, a nice big block of land and they uh, run their business via the internet together. So that might be one lifestyle choice they could have. Another one might be they might want to build an asset for their children. So it's a long-term vision they have of what they want with their business and they're building this asset for their children. Or alternatively, they might work, want to work hard for 10 years 
and head off to new, sell the business and head off to Noosa thereafter. Now these are all lifestyle opportunities, uh, aligning their lifestyle with their business, which really is difficult to do for non-couple partnerships. And there, and for uh, couples in business, explicitly or implicitly, they tend to align their business, uh, plan their business this way. With non-couple partners, they have quite different personal goals and family situations. What they need to do is be totally honest with each other with their personal plans. They have their separate families, whether they're related or not, whether they're brothers or just totally unrelated. So the family pressures will always be different, but they have to be upfront with their personal situation so they can plan around it. So for example, one partner might want to grow the business and the other might be looking for an exit and retire. So proper planning can accommodate both objectives. So that's the first key lesson I see between non-couple and uh, non-couple partnerships. They need to look at a way to align their personal goals with their business goals so they don't come in conflict. Now another advantage for couples is they tend to have a longer term focus when they look at their business. Whereas the non-couple relationship is likely to have a more commercial focus. And studies show that a long-term focus produces better business results. And this is therefore an advantage for couples in business and a disadvantage for non-couple partners with different agendas. And because they have a different agendas, they tend to have a shorter term focus. And again, in planning and incorporating their personal objectives will allow the non-couple partners to uh, better incorporate their longer term desires and be able to better longer term plan. So even if one wants to exit early and, and the issue might be is whether uh, they both contribute an investment to further allow the business to grow rather than just take profit with their open and honest about what their longer term objectives are, they can see how they can get part of that longer term value if they exit early. Or alternative might be they might want to sell down part of their share and allow another person to take up their share and, and, and slowly exit the business that way. But being open and honest about their personal goals and how they sit with the longer term plans of the business can address that uh, shortcoming between uh, the uh, short-term focus versus the long-term focus. Another area of difference between couples and non-couples is the priorities they set for, the, uh, for their business goals. Now for a family, that, a couple in business, they will almost always prioritise their family over the business perspective. Now non-couples tend to steer away from that because they realise it creates conflict. You know, there, there might be a temptation to do favours for the other uh, person's family members. So you know, maybe hire their son or daughter into the business and then they find out that maybe they would have been better off hiring someone totally separate uh, and independent and is better suited for the job. And that can potentially create conflict. So, Non-couples in business tend to steer away deliberately from family choices within the, in the business because they realise it's going to create a conflict. Now for families in business, they will potentially make these decisions quite deliberately to put family first and there's nothing wrong with that as long as they really think through the impacts that's going to have on the family, it might be the absolutely right decision, but they need to decide whether that's for shorter or longer term. And they might also consider what they need to do to mitigate those decisions. Uh, for example, one of the couple might decide to work part time so they can spend more time caring for the children. So do they pay someone else to fill the gap or do they just wear the business impact and adjust their lifestyle accordingly? Again, there are no wrong answers here except if the impacts have not been properly considered and make sure and explicitly accepted. For uh, non-couple partners, as I say, they tend to avoid such com uh, conflicts naturally and don't prioritise family at the expense of their commercial relationship they have with their partner. 
couples also tend to be more risk adverse, which means they don't leverage their business in a way that non-couple partners might. And because of that, their returns could be lower. And couples do this because their whole family income may depend on the business, whereas non-couple partners may have other sources of income as well. But what is important to do is for couples to get good advice from a financial planner. And, and just as an aside, it amazes me how many business owners don't have a financial planner, couples or not. Just go and get one because you really are in a totally different situation if you're a, uh, a person who owns a business versus an employee, particularly if you're a poor employee of a large business. So uh, absolutely critical that you get that independent financial advice of your personal situation and the impact of that on the business decisions you're making. So for couples in business, the financial plan will understand their risk profile and whether it's, uh, it is acceptable to take more risk in their, given, in their business given their financial position. And even for non-couple partners, getting that independent financial advice is highly recommended. Now, the next area of difference between couples and non-couples is the level of trust. Now, for couples in business, whether married or in a de facto relationship, the law follows the principle, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. So it doesn't matter whether you're the technical specialist in the business and, and, and the other person is just keeping the books. The law will be blind to that and so uh, they will see that the business is shared equally between the two. So even from the legal perspective, the, the, uh, the uh, couples can have that level of trust within the business. And as I say, because they share the rewards together, irrespective if one is only keeping the books versus the other is, you know, uh, might be the uh, providing the specialist service, they share the rewards together. In a non-couple relationship, there can be a trust deficit. And, you know, if one, you know, and it's really important that, you know, they're seen to be both contributing equally. And that trust deficit tends to be made up through formal legal agreements and contingency plans. So there tends to be a much more formal structure uh, in a non-couple relationship than in a couple relationship, which can lead to uh, pluses and minuses. Um, but even for couples, there can be a breakdown in trust. And there's not always a fairy tale ending, unfortunately. So it's advisable even for couples to consider an agreement of what happens to their business if they separate. And while this can be a difficult decision to put in, if you like, a business prenup, because it can be seen as a lack of trust, and I can understand why couples don't do it on their personal assets, because they're seen as a personal trust. In the case of a business, uh, it's in neither partner's interest to see the destruction of the value of an asset to both of them that would otherwise contribute to the total value they would share on separation. Unfortunately for many couples married to the business, the business often does, doesn't survive separation. The business just folds and that's in no one's interest. So it's important that uh, the value is somehow preserved in some agreement. So getting a lawyer to put in place an agreement to protect the value of a business is an ounce of prevention um, worth many pounds of cure, providing an asset that they both can share in the un unpleasant event that they both have to separate. So thinking about that first can make sure that asset is there with value to share. As I say, for non-couples, they tend to have something already in place, but they might want to revisit it as their personal situation changes. Another issue that we see both in both types of business relationship is the need for conflict resolution. Now, conflict is inevitable whenever you've got any sort of partnership. But the question is whether it will just be a low-level skir skirmish or nuclear war. We probably want to avoid the, the latter. 
So differences of opinions can be healthy, in fact are healthy, versus a groupthink situation where no one ever questions anyone. Raising problems that, that need to be addressed is a healthy sign of any business relationship. However, couples tend to avoid addressing issues as they put the personal relationship before the business relationship. So, and good business uh, and good personal relationships are based on give and take, and therefore, couples tend to wait until issues become too big to ignore. Non-couple partners, on the other hand, don't tend to be so reticent. And I have seen partners, partners, non-couple partners, quite critical of each other while I'm sitting in front of them as a business advisor. In fact, outright arguing and shouting at each other at each other. Uh, whereas couples tend to be far more protective. And even if one of them is at fault, there, there is uh, one covers them up, the other up, because they're, they're a protective relationship. And, and that's good, and it's also not so good. And uh, what happens is that couples can be uh, more blinded uh, to the underlying issues that exist in the business than non-couple partners and the issues come out more readily in non-couple partners than they do in non-couple partners. And these differences can be caused by poor information systems and analysis because the flip side of trust in a, a relationship with a couple is an informality and not having the formal business reporting and information systems which are uh, uh, really critical in uh, a non-couple relationship. So while there might well still be trust in a, in a couple, in a non-couple business relationship, it's more likely to be trust and verify. Whereas the informality means you don't necessarily have those systems in place in the non-couple relationship, so it's critical for them to start to put in place these reporting systems, particularly as their business grows. And as they have those reporting systems, they're better able to understand the issues in their business sooner and address them sooner and more objectively. Also having Reference to the agreed strategy for a business for taking difficult decisions can also take the heat out of many situations, and that applies to both couples and non-couples in business. And that's going back to the original vision behind the business, can remind partners of the direction they should be taking in these sorts of situations. Discipline is also an issue, uh, doing the right thing at the right time. So in a relationship, discipline or even routine can be a big negative. While surprises can spice up any relationship, in a, big, in a business that can be a big negative. So non-couples realise sooner that this and formalise as many functions as possible within their businesses, ensuring that everything is driven by a business management system. And this includes formal roles for each of the partners. The informality between couples can work against this, whereas for non-couple partners, each has to be seen to be pulling their own weight. And often in a business relationship, there are complementary skills, and this is a good thing. And what you might find is one may be more technically focused and the other more business focused, which can be quite a good strength. And if it's true that opposites attract in a personal relationship, then couples have a, a, an advantage here. And formalising roles is essential for all types of ownerships and leads to best, better discipline. And this is specifically true to uh, couples in business where the relationships are going to be more naturally more informal. And I think the final point I'd like to relate, raise here is getting advice. Because as business grows and a different lifestyle life uh, life cycle stages, the knowledge needed changes. And when a business plateaus, that's a sign that the natural skills of the owners are actually approaching their li limits. And with better business management si skills and business management systems for non-couple partners, they recognize this sooner and more quickly see the need to get advice. And couples 
are more likely to struggle on and delay getting that advice. And this results in missed opportunities, so couples must be aware that at some point it's important to get that advice, especially to address the lack of structure that places them at a disadvantage to their non-couple uh, competitors. For non-couples, comparing and contrasting the difference between their businesses and couple businesses, it's imp important to understand the shortcomings and to compensate for them and incorporate your personal plans into your business plans, at making allowances for the difference in personal plans between the non-couple partners. Now, for couples in business, because it's so much of their life, the highs are higher, but unfortunately the reverse is also true. But the biggest advantage they have over other business relationships is the trust they have between them, and that makes the difference. They also have a longer term focus, whereas in other relationships, it's more about the rate, rate of return. And that's not to say they can't have good returns. Couples have an opportunity to design a business that meets their lifestyle needs in a way that no other business partnership can replicate. They just need the time and take the time to plan it. So couples married to the business must remember when the celebrant says, for richer or poorer, it's a choice. Thank you. Dr. Chapman, that was very good and uh, a, a very good very deep understanding of uh, you know both sides of the stories and what one has to offer and the other one. It almost seems that like um, non-couples need to learn from couples and couples need to learn from non-couples in terms of finding that happy happy medium in so many regards. I've got a couple of questions for you that people have been throwing out. Um, and uh, the questions I'd like to ask you are from people writing on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. Is it, is it almost necessary then that for people who, who are couples in personally almost need to write the, a business contract very much similar to what non-couples would write when they start a business and whether it includes personal or non-personal business stuff but to have a, a, a contract between them that outlines how they're going to run the business, what's going to happen when certain things come so they have that relationship, business relationship as well as a personal relationship and they can keep them separate um, when they need to. Mm. I, I think there are two aspects to that, two answers to that, uh, parts of the answer to that question, Sean. And uh, the first, just take on the legal part first. Uh, in fact, when I wrote the book, what I did is I actually asked a colleague of mine who's actually a, a divorce lawyer. <laughs> Fortunately, I've never had to use her services, <laughs> so I'm by the name of uh, Lynn Lucas, and uh, she wrote the appendix for the book, and she addresses the uh, need to have a formal legal agreement uh, to protect the business asset. What happens if, they need, if couples need to separate? Hopefully it never happens, but the idea is to protect the value of the business in case they have to separate. Now, putting aside that legal side, and really what my advice would be to go and consult a, a business lawyer to structure that, I'd also advise uh, non-couples in business to do the same, to make sure that the contingency planning in the case they, uh, the business partners want to separate, even though they're not personally related, um, that uh, all those contingencies are properly taken into account. And the earlier on you do that in the business, the less pain there's going to be. But for the informal part of this, how you're going to uh, form, how you're going to work together, and I call this in the book the declaration of dependence, how they're going to depend on each other, how, what they agree they're going to do, and what they're going to agree not to do, so the rules of engagement. So having quite clear rules of engagement so that uh, uh, one rule of engagement might be never to criticise the other in front of the staff. Nice, and that's and that's and that's so so important because you might do it in person, but uh, and feel comfortable <laughs> doing that in person. But uh, I guess when you're when you're working side by side, you need to kind of have those business formalities. Yes, 
and uh, and it might well another one might be to make sure keep the other uh, partner fully informed and involved in any critical decisions. So you can come up with a rule book like this, and and uh, and that's not to say those rules are never breached, but you need to make sure that. Uh, people are aware, the, uh, both are aware of the rules and they can point out if there's a, if, if an argument arises, well, let's go back to the rules of engagement, uh, the declaration of dependence, this is what we said we would do. And that can take some of the heat out of uh, any debate. It's also important to understand, even if they have different, quite different roles, and one might be the specialist and the other the non-specialist, how they work together. So one might sort of take a, a leadership role in the day to day just because of their specialist knowledge. They both are equal partners in the business. So they need to separate out the day to day uh, with the ownership roles they both have in the business. They're both so is that talking like responsibilities and expectations, almost like what are your responsibilities in this business and what are your responsibilities in the business and what do we expect to happen each week so that we feel it's a fair mix between what we must be achieving in business. Yes, well, there's the day-to-day -day operations and there's the ownership role. In fact, that legally, they're both directors in the business. And they, they need to have time when they sit as equals on the board as directors of the business and make decisions at that level. And then they, one of them might wear then a CEO's hat, a managing director's hat, for day-to-day -day operations, under, uh, uh, implement, responsible for implementing the decisions they both make at the board level. So the board sets policy and a set strategy, and then one of them may well take a leadership role for day-to-day -day, uh, running of the business, but all they're doing is implementing what they've already agreed at board level. Okay, and just a quick question with, with, with regards to families and couples, there must be a lot of emotion involved in, in decision making or the, the way things happen in business which might not, you would still get between non-couples but I'm sure there's a lot more emotion with couples or family members. How do they negate that? Well this is where the structure is so important. Having a formal structures that allows, that so people know having very clear roles so they can when they step out of the office into the family home they know that they're wearing a different hat and you know being able to say if someone comes up with a, a business issue they say well let's put let's put that on hold and discuss that when we get into the office so you have different spaces and different places and different times for addressing the business issues so they're not discussing who said what to a client over dinner. And yeah. but it's also having the formal process of review and structure. So what uh, how the business is managed day to day and how they review the performance day to day. So if some of them questions a decision the other is making, they might refer to a strategic decision they both took as peers on a board about the strategy they were taking the company. So you might say something like, okay, we said we wanted to act in this particular way. Uh, this is going to be our policy for this type of uh, situation. Do we want to make a special, uh, do we want to make a special situation for this particular client or this particular employee? Are we making a special case of this person or are we going to go back? Are we going to change the rules? So taking it back to a higher level can often diffuse the situation. So someone will say, no, we shouldn't be making a special case here. You're right. So that can diffuse the situation. So having a higher level position on the way you view things can help make the decisions at the tactical level as well. That's great feedback, Dr. Chapman. I, I definitely think those structures are so important, often missed when family members or couples go into a relationship because, hey, it's going to be perfect, right? Um, I got a question here from uh, someone on Twitter, and they just asked using hashtag SydneyBizMonth. They asked, in non-couple relationships, 
often the biggest challenges when they're fighting, and I'm obviously ab living here for this gentleman, is that is is that um, that often one person feels they're working harder than the other, and there's a well, there's a disagreement in 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 what in in the effort that one must put be putting into the businesses. Well. It I, I think that that can happen, and uh, I had uh, one person say to me, "It helps if you're only four only four foot tall, so it all goes over your head." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I think the difference is in a in a couple relationship, they both share the rewards. It all ends up in the family bank account. Uh, but you're quite right. Uh, they need to uh, perform. They both need to pull their weight, but the issue doesn't seem tends to be quite the same as in non-couple relationships, where it's much more commercial. And and it might be, for ex you can have a situation where one uh, member of the couple has a, a, um, a debil debilitating illness, making them unable to contribute as much, but the other person just takes on the load, and. But you know, if if that's not the situation, one seems to be goofing off. <laughs> well, I think it's the same as housework as well. You deal deal with it the same way, don't you? I guess so. It's um, it it, it certainly is a challenge. I um, I know that people often, you know, they they're both splitting the the returns, yet one feels um, one feels like they're doing all the hard work and hard lifting, and eventually that that frustration grows and builds. Um, well, well, what, what well, going back to, yeah. well, well, going back to the going back to the, the tradie and his wife situation, you know, so that uh, who's a plumber, he's got his hands down drains covered in the proverbial all day, uh, and <laughs> and the wives at home in a, in a, a nice clean office, but they understand their roles. But this is why the, the the importance of understanding the roles, and and quite often when I'm dealing with couples in that situation, it's well understood the contribution both makes, and and the person with their hands down the drains also understands someone has to take the booking, someone has to make sure all the staff get paid, someone needs to be doing the marketing because the, the guy with the hands down the drain is probably not doing a hell of a lot of marketing. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, and, and you know, some, and someone's got to collect the invoices and make sure that people get paid. Yes. And uh, yes. The, the bank's paid and bills are paid and all these kind of things. Yes. And, and, and so it's, it's, that's why the importance of the roles, it's really important to understand what the roles are. And, and from time to they need to have regular meetings too to make sure they understand what each of them is doing. That's really critical. And that also applies to non-couple partners as well. Yeah, I was actually about to say that. Um, in meetings, but even for couples, you know, meetings shouldn't be safe for bedtime. They must be safe for, um, I guess, the boardroom, and it's obviously sometimes a challenge. Yes, that's, and and it's important to that, to make them, uh, you know, reasonably formal. You know, so you know, you're not uh, the TV is not on. You're not doing it over dinner or anything like that. So in a place where you can focus and concentrate, as if it was you know a non-couple. Um, uh, Looking over the uh, the monthly review of their business, looking at the uh, the financials and and the, and the uh, reviewing the results of the last month. So you need to make it as formal as possible, in the same way uh, a non-couple business would do. Yeah, that and a lot of this used to boil down to communication and effective communication between people. Um, you, sp you spoke briefly about uh, priorities and being up front and I think one of the, th the cool things you spoke about was incorporating personal plans for non-couples, making sure that it's not just about dollars and cents but that it's about those personal priorities and lifestyles that you've got within the non-couple relationships. Can you just talk to us quickly about how people need to go about incorporating those uh, personal plans within the commercial aspects of a non-couple relationship or partnership? Well, again, this is not an easy thing to do, but um, partners need to be open with each other on what it is they're looking for from the business, and you know whether they. Uh, you, know, you might have one partner who's just going to be wants to be there for ten years and then go off and do something else. They want to build a business up, not build a business up, and then 
move on to do something else. Or uh, they may well want to take a uh, move to take a, um, a silent partner role at some point. So they just need to be very clear up front what it is and then put in place transition plans so that uh, as one person might be stepping back or as I say, if one person say, well, I just don't want to reinvest, keep on reinvesting in the business, I just want to actually start to extract value, they need to start thinking about uh, ownership, equity plans. So this would be part of the discussion and it might be a part of the strategic discussion they have once or twice a year. They should put on the table any personal changes they have and, and talk openly about how that is going to affect the business. That's that's a great and um, before we finish off, uh, Dr. Chapman, uh, you spoke quite clearly about uh, bringing expert advice. Do you often find that uh, couples request you to come be to be the middle person, the broker, I guess, <laughs> between <laughs> conflicting couples? I mean, there must be times when there's just that log ahead, and, and no one's going to make a decision or budge. It's got to a point. I mean, you know, obviously, you did say suggest that you get expert advice, whether it be financial or business planning, before it gets to that point. But what do couples get to when they when they just can't make that decision anymore between well, each other? I actually address that in the book. I, I don't I, I don't claim to be a marriage counsellor and, and, and my <laughs> wife would be the first to say that uh, you shouldn't hire me as a marriage counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a situation with one couple client I was dealing with and uh, I'd been working with them for a number of months and I uh, got an email uh, from the wife and it was quite a long email explaining why she was resigning from the business <laughs> and uh, she had decided uh, uh, she, she wanted to put the personal relationship above the, uh, the business relationship and uh, she couldn't uh, she had trouble working alongside her husband and uh, and uh, Within 24 hours, I got an equally passionate email from him, saying, "You know, how it wasn't all his fault, and you know, how he actually, you know, it was a good email, saying how he respected her contribution, and quite frankly, was a bit unsure how he would uh, manage the business without her." Wow. And and I actually got their permission, and these two emails are a centerpiece of the book. So I just lightly edited the emails just to disguise the uh, uh, people <laughs> behind them, but the passion is all there. And, and what happened was that um, I had a conversation with each of them independently and I found out really that the, the wife really didn't want to resign from the business, but she didn't know the, the, any other way. And, and, I, and I also had a similar conversation with the husband and we worked out a forward plan of how we would get over some of these issues and uh, so it wasn't the question really wasn't about uh, divorce here it was just working together and was, again going back to uh, my uh, book distributors uh, wife he actually just fired her from the business <laughs> 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 but he hadn't read my book at the time <laughs> For Dr. Chapman, I, obviously there are a lot of people out there who are in business partnerships, whether they're couples or non-couples, um, who I'm sure clearly need your advice. I, I've certainly been in partner relationships and there, there are hard work from time to time. Um, for those people who'd like to um, purchase or know more about your book, can you just tell us more about your book and uh, where they can get a copy? Well, the book's on its own website, marriedtothebusiness.com.au, or if you just want to find more about me, if you could go to uh, www.empowersolutions.com.au, you can find out about my other books, or if you're interested, you could request a complimentary business evaluation. And that can all be done on the empower uh, empowersolutions.com.au websites? That's right. It leads to all the other websites. Okay, fantastic, uh, Dr. Chapman. Thank you very much for your time. You've been, uh, you've shared so much good quality content with us for couples out there and business partnerships. I, I thank you very much for being so open with us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sean, for your hospitality. Being my first Google Plus Hangout, I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, that's another episode of Solving Business Problems. Today we went into talking about partnerships between couples and non-couples. We had the very enlightening uh, Dr. Chapman, um, who's got a best-selling author on this topic, chat to us about this. Um, I highly recommend that if you're out there and you're in a relationship, in a partnership or just in a partnership with a non-relationship person, it's, you know, there are challenges that go with them. I highly recommend that you pop over to Dr. Chapman's uh, uh, website, which you can clearly see there, empowersolutions.com.au, and uh, find out more information about either a consultation or read the book. Um, that's it from this edition of Solving Business Problems. It's been fantastic having you on the show. Please stay tuned. We have a lot more shows coming up with more solutions we tackle for small businesses. That's part of the September Small Business Show. It's been fantastic having Dr. Chapman involved. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you at one of our coming shows. From us, goodbye. <laughs>